here. Okay, so we're running live now. More trolleyology today. Here we go. Okay, so if you can hear me well, you can see my screen. Let's do the administrative matter real quick. Um, where is it? Okay, no, nope, not there. Sorry about that. So what I'm gonna go ahead and do is um, a lot for just a bit more class time. So six to 720. Um, since I said the course were 710, if you duck out at 710 um, regularly, that's okay. Um, obviously it's, you know, you're, you're here optionally anyway. So I do appreciate you all being here though. And then office hours, since I um, uh, extended the class time a little bit, we're going to start office hours a little bit later and then they'll run a little bit later. Um, if we need to do a workaround on the office hours for any of you individually, just let me know. Okay, that's the administrative matter, real easy. Let's see, so let's see, I think last time if I'm right, we talked just very briefly about Thompson's um, reply to those who would use the killing versus letting die and the um, Kantian formula of humanity principle to resolve, solve the uh, trolley problem. So just so we're um, remembering what the trolley problem is, it's captured here on this slide. What explains the moral difference between the original trolley and transplant cases? Told two days ago, so maybe we need a refresher on what the original trolley and transplant cases are. Um, remember, keep in mind that whatever explains the difference is a non-utilitarian ethical principle or claim. I'll just note that, that uh, parenthetical, um, quickly come back to it. So let's see. Um, right, here we go. We got the initial trolley cases. This is the original trolley case. Sure, you're all remembering this one, but just to refresh um, the memories, just in case um, there's um, some issues with remembering some of the particulars of the cases. So you're zooming along the trolley, that's you in the trolley. There's a switch that you could use. If you activate the switch, then you end up um, redirecting the danger that the, these five are in, these, these um, trolley track workers to the one trolley track worker, if you flip the switch. If you do nothing, then you're just gonna smash into and kill the five, okay? Or you're gonna smash into kill the five. I shouldn't say just to do that, uh, that'd be pretty serious. And what Thompson claims is the overwhelming judgment in the case is that it's permissible for you to flip the switch. It'd be permissible for anyone in the situation, all things being equal to flip the switch, right? You can imagine like it, um, you know, the intuition or the judgment shifting. If you're in the trolley and you imagine um, your mom being over here, but that's to really mess with the all things being equal proviso that we use. Does that make sense? So the original trolley doesn't involve that. That might be some mom trolley case that we can develop. So remember the trolley problem is that there's a moral difference between the uh, original trolley and transplant case. And so what's a transplant case? Well, here it is. Remember it involves you, the surgeon, you have five dying patients in your clinic. And you have a healthy patient who just walked in the door. The dying patients need an, need an organ. You can get all the organs from healthy patient. You just have to, um, or you would have to kill the healthy patient. So perform surgery on healthy patient, harvest healthy patients' organs, and then um, trans, uh, perform transplant procedures on the dying patients to save them. So the thought is, is look, in the original trolley case, you can permissibly or morality allows one to redirect danger from the five to the one. It's like a big picture way of thinking about it. Morality allows us to do that. We want to know what in morality or what explains why morality allows us to do that. But the case suggests that um, 
morality lets us do it. Maybe morality requires us to do it. There's debate about that, as Thompson notes. And then in this case, right, we could redirect, as the surgeon, we could redirect the danger that the dying patients are in, couldn't we, to the, to the, da to the danger had by the healthy patient. We can take away the danger the dying patients are in by just giving them the organs that the healthy patient has. Does that make sense? So in both cases, you have that, that going on. But in the original trolley case, it's permissible to do the redirecting. And in the surgeon case, it isn't. Does that make sense? So what explains that moral difference between the cases? And it can't be utilitarianism, right? Because utilitarianism, the view which says we should promote the happiness of all, would seem to suggest that what we need to do in the surgeon, in the transplant case, is have surgeon um, perform surgery on the healthy patient, to have his organs harvested. Okay. So, um, so that's just to refresh your memory on, on the two cases, the trolley problem itself, at least initially here. All right, and I've just explained this parenthetical. Thompson, she's no utilitarian thinker. Okay, so we saw a foot solution. I think we talked about it briefly last time. The moral difference between original trolley and transplant is the following. In original trolley, it's morally permissible to kill the one in order to save the five because it is better, all things equal, to kill one than it is to kill five. So it's, it's kill versus kill in the original trolley case. Okay. So um, when we're redirecting danger, we're redirecting danger to kill from a case of the danger involving killing. And then in transplant foot argues that it's more impermissible to kill the one in order to save the five because it is better to, um, to let five die than it is to kill the one. Okay. So there's a moral difference between killing and letting die generally, and then you just fill in the numbers. Okay. And you see how the killing versus letting die is not a utilitarian principle. It's better to let five die than it is to kill the one. The utilitarians would say there's no moral difference between killing and letting die. What's morally relevant are the consequences, the outcomes. So it'd be better to kill one than let five die. Does that make sense? So when you let five die, um, Um, as opposed to killing the one, you end up with a minus four number of lives saved, right? So holding a whole lot of things fixed that could be relevant, your happiness levels, lifespan levels, and all the rest of the individuals in question, you end up with more happiness, it seems, overall, if you killed the one. The killing versus the letting die principle says, no, killing is so serious that it's better to let the five die. Okay, let me... I have a quick question. Of course. Um, wouldn't you also be killing the one? In what case? Like in the trolley? Because if you, like the one isn't really in danger in the first place, kind of like the healthy patient. Yeah, that's, that's but if you look at this, foot, foot recognizes that in the original trolley case, you're killing one or you're killing five. In both cases, you're killing. Oh, okay, okay. I see. So the, the letting die just isn't even an option in the original trolley case. And that's what accounts for the moral difference because in the transplant case, it is alive, at least according to Foote's understanding of things. Now, one thing that Thompson does say in reply to Foote here and in other places is just that um, some killings involve letting dies, lettings die, as she puts it. So, um, or sometimes it doesn't look like there's a moral difference between um, killing and letting die. And famous cases have been developed to try to um, to try to show that. So one famous case is like imagine you want um, you want uh, your nephew's inheritance, and so you 
you go upstairs, you plan to, you plan to kill your nephew. He's taking a bath or something. So you hold him underwater, you kill him and all the rest. Okay. And then you get the inheritance. But now imagine it as, so that's the case of killing, obviously morally atrocious case, but now imagine a case where you plan to kill your nephew to get his inheritance. You go upstairs to kill your nephew. Um, but your nephew starts drowning for whatever reason, maybe the radio drops in the water. I don't know. And he's drowning. You could save your nephew's life, but you just stand there and just count it out. Five, four, three, two, one, dead. Boom. You let, you let your nephew die. That's morally atrocious as well. It doesn't look like there's a more difference between killing and letting die in cases like these. Okay. Cause so hopefully that clarified some things for you and for others who may have had similar questions. Okay. Um, so Thompson's reply to foot involves thinking about the bystander case, remember? So let's get to the bystander case. I think I have it here. It was a bit more convoluted than the original trolley case. So everything's like the original trolley case, except you, you faint. Okay, there's a default direction going to the right here. You can't use a switch, obviously, because you're unconscious. I mean, just think about the psychological um, um, discomfort that would cause you being in a situation where you had to make a decision like this. But no worries, there's bystander who has a switch. The switch does the same thing as the switch in the trolley would do. And so if bystander doesn't do anything, then what Thompson claims is that's on a par with letting the five die. Okay, he certainly isn't in the trolley. He's not directing the trolley or anything like that. So Thompson wants to say, this seems like a case of, of letting die if there is any. And then um, if bystander flips the switch, then bystander is killing, killing one. Thompson says, okay, what's the difference in these cases? The key difference is just that it's a bystander as opposed to this person who faints who's making the decision. So if an original trolley, it was okay, if morality permitted um, us to flip the switch to kill the one, redirecting danger in that direction, then bystander can do the same thing in this case. So, so she claims that she has the strong moral judgment and many others do as well that bystander can, morally speaking, um, flip the switch to kill uh, the one, thus putting the five out of danger, putting the one in danger. I think the easiest way of thinking about the argument for that, again, is just that there's no moral difference between original trolley and bystander. The fact that you have fainting happening here, not that big a deal. But I think the bystander bit is supposed to build in the fact that there'd be a case, this, this case would involve letting die as opposed to killing, you see? So it would be killing versus killing in this case, it's killing versus letting die. But then Thompson's like, looks like the bystander can flip the switch. So it's better to kill the one than it is let the five die. That counts against the killing versus letting die principle, which has it that it's, that it's worse to kill one than to let five die, right? Okay, and then, then there's a formula of humanity. I think we just talked about briefly last time. So this is a principle from Kant, Kant's ethics, 18th century German philosopher, anti-utilitarian philosopher in a major way. So the formula of humanity has that it's always morally wrong to treat humanity as a mere means to one's ends. It's always morally wrong to treat humanity as a mere thing. And it's always morally required to treat humanity as an end in itself. In other words, it's always morally required that we treat humanity as if humanity is priceless or has absolute worth. So Conti actually argues for the claim that humanity has um, an absolute worth by arguing that there's no price that you can assign to human life. Even though we have done so in human history, we were wrong to do so. So that's just a way of understanding the formula of humanity. 
Uh, Thompson doesn't really go into too much detail with the formula of humanity. She ultimately thinks that these ideas like mere means to one's ends and ends in itself, she thinks that these terms aren't too helpful morally. But anyway, she develops a case against it anyways. So the way the formula of humanity would be used to solve the, um, the trolley problem involves thinking about one and two as I have listed here on the slide. One does not violate the formula of humanity merely by killing the one in order to save the five in the original trolley case. But surgeon in the transplant case violates the formula of humanity by killing HP in order to save um, the DPs, killing the healthy patient in order to save the dying patients. Again, in transplant. Okay. Okay, now Thompson doesn't get into trying to support this. This is just something that you know drops out of Kantian thinking. That's widely accepted. But of course, this would, if we're doing Kantian ethics, require some discussion. Thompson, though, sets it aside, grants it for argument's sake, and then develops a loop case against it. So even granting what Kantians think is true about the formula of humanity, what it implies, morally speaking, the loop case is going to show that it fails. The formula of humanity fails, to be precise. So then we move from bystander to loop case, don't we? And loop case looks just like bystander, except for we add some track here. We add some material here, some extra wood and some pipes or whatever. And then we add some more mass over here. We add mass to the one. We leave this mass the same over here. So you have bystander at the switch, you have the fainting person in the trolley, you have the looping track, so we call it the loop case. And here I call this individual the portly fella, PF. Portly meaning husky, large, right? Um, originally, this individual was called the fat man. I'm trying to be politically correct and nice. This is the portly fella, big guy, husky guy, whatever. And I introduced portly fella earlier than Thompson introduces the fat man later on in the paper. So this is kind of a cameo, an early anachronistic cameo appearance, if you'll work with me on that. Okay. So here's the big picture argument that Thompson gives. Bystander case and loop case are such that there's no moral difference between them. So since bystander can flip the switch in the bystander case, bystander can flip the switch in the loop case, like morally speaking. Here's her, here's her argument. How can mass here with this individual, the one workman, the one work person, or the one worker, and, and the amount of track that's added here amount to a moral difference between these cases? So the... Um, the form of humanity fails. Here's why. That part sort of needs to be built in and thought about um, uh, somewhat carefully. The thing is, is bystander has to target specific features had by the poorly fellow, by PF, namely the mass had by PF. And he uses these features had by PF in such a way that he's treating the poorly fellow as a mere means as a mere tool, as a mere instrument for his purposes for saving uh, the five. So the thought here is supposed to be, I think, um, look, if, if bystander does nothing, then the trolley is going to zoom and kill the five, loop around, and smash and kill the poorly fella. OK? So the other option is flip the switch, kill the poorly fella to save the five. The mass of the poorly fell is going to stop the stop the trolley, or stop it eventually. Maybe it stops here. I don't know. Just stipulate. It's not going to hit the five, so the five are going to be fine. Okay. So formula of humanity um, is such that it has a has a counter example in this loop trolley case, so it can't be used to explain the moral difference between the original trolley and transplant. Gotcha. So since it's permissible to kill um, the portly fella in the loop case, 
consequently of humanity fails, it's not true. So it can't be used in order to explain the moral difference between original trolley and transplant. Okay, so trolleyology can um, help us, it can be useful in, in multiple ways, but one of the ways it can be useful is in helping us think about and or evaluating ethical and moral principles theories. So we've got utilitarianism, which we've talked about. We've got the killing versus letting die. The killing is worse than letting die principle or the killing versus letting die principle. And then the formula of humanity. Okay, so we've learned some decent theory just by thinking about these hypothetical trolley cases. And I'll say more about these theories and principles as you can imagine, even this time, but as the course goes on as well. Okay, so we can skip that one. This is just recapping the original for, uh, formulation of the trolley problem. Here are the trolley cases that we've talked about so far, just as a, as a brief, just sketch recap of the cases. We have the original trolley, we have the transplant case, remember that involves a surgeon. So it's not really a trolley case, but it's included in trolleyology cases because it's sort of these, one of the foundational cases in the trolleyology studies, beginning with Foote and Thompson. And then we have the bystander at the switch case and then the loop case. Uh, we'll talk about one other uh, trolley case in a little bit. Again, this is just, we have these theories and principles so far. I just wanted to say a couple of things that might be helpful. So um, with utilitarianism, we'll learn more about it as the course goes on. But here's a slogan to, to guide us initially in thinking about utilitarianism. Something you can hang your hat on when you think about it quickly. It gets more sophisticated and complicated when you think more carefully about utilitarianism, but this is an initially perfectly fine slogan to use. Promote the happiness of all. Okay, promote the happiness of all. Okay, so um, it falls under the category of ethical theories known as consequentialism. And the slogan for consequentialism, if you wanted something to hang your head on is promote the good. Promote the good. What the utilitarian does is define the good as the happiness of all. Okay. And all is typically all sentient beings or all the sentient beings that would be affected by one's actions, something like that. Okay, the killing is uh, more the worse than letting die principle. I think you have a pretty good grasp of this one, I'm, um, I'm guessing. Um, this is a general principle. Um, a, a particular kind of uh, case might be helpful for understanding the general principle, one that you're likely familiar with. Think about the difference between active and passive euthanasia. Those who endorse passive euthanasia in the biomedical ethical literature um, or just generally because they thought about these issues, they, um, um, they're likely to um, understand passive euthanasia as a form of letting die. Many of those advocates of passive euthanasia aren't advocates of active euthanasia because they think that active euthanasia is killing and killing is worse than letting die. Many of them would claim that killing is or intentionally killing is always wrong. There's different kinds of uh, folks who endorse this kind of principle, but um, currently in our, in our biomedical practices, as far as we think about euthanasia involving um, the medical professionals doing the killing or the letting die, um, active euthanasia, under, when we understand euthanasia in, in, the ways that I, in the way that I just described, um, is currently forbidden whereas passive euthanasia is, permiss is permissible. So long as some very significant conditions are satisfied. So just keep in mind that I'm, I'm defining euthanasia differently than how I would define um, physician assisted suicide, even though you'll see them lumped together in places. The difference is just in who's doing the killing, right? When physician assisted suicide, it is suicide, it is self-killing. Euthanasia, it's the physician who's doing the killing if it's, act, if it's active euthanasia. If it's, a, if it's a letting die, if it's a passive euthanasia situation, it's the physician who's directing the letting die, typically with the palliative care, morphine and other drugs that help um, someone pass peacefully in that way. 
Okay, then there's a form of humanity. I just want to give you a slogan for it. And we'll talk more about it too, but treat humanity with the absolute worth they have. And you can do that positively or negatively. Kant works this out in some of his works. So you treat humanity with absolute worth they have negatively by not treating them as a mere tool or instrument, but positively Kant says things like you, you take up the goals that um, others have and you make them yours such that you help them help others attain their goals. You help improve their humanity in that way, Kant would put it. Okay. So Thompson, she offers a solution. So let's turn to that. Let's turn to, to Thompson's solution. She focuses though on the bystander and transplant cases in her solution to the trolley problem. So she sets up the trolley problem by initially by having us think about the original trolley case and the transplant case. But when she offers her solution, she switches. You may have noticed this. If you didn't, it kind of happens quickly. She switches to the bystander and transplant cases. So the question then becomes, the question that needs answering to solve the trolley problem is this then, what explains the moral difference between bystander and transplant? We remember Thompson doesn't think there's a moral difference between original trolley and, and bystander, remember? So there's, if, if that's the case, then there's no problem with swapping out the original trolley case at this point and using bystander, okay? Okay, so what's the moral difference between bystander and transplant? Remember, in bystander, um, the bystander at the switch is within his moral rights or he's morally permitted to flip the switch to direct the danger to the one, a trolley worker, away from the five. In transplant, the surgeon is not allowed to redirect the danger from the five dying patients to a healthy patient. What explains that? So we're, we're dealing with Thompson's solution. She doesn't go killing versus letting die. She certainly doesn't go utilitarianism. She does not go um, formula of humanity for the reasons we've already talked about. Her solution involves thinking about this concept of a right. And one of Thompson's main contributions in her ethical works um, across the board is, is, is um, with respect to thinking about, thinking carefully about what it means to have rights, having the right to life, and the like. In the abortion debate, um, her defense of abortion paper, she does a nice job of, of helping us think about when a fetus has the right to the use of a female's body, for example. So um, what is a right? I'm gonna say a couple of things. This is a little bit of a sidebar for the rest of the slide here, um, but I'll just mention um, to help um, with um, some foundational ideas and thinking about having a right, or think about what a right is. So I imagine many of you have a good sense of what it, what it means to have a right. But a right is a claim that one can make to something, perhaps from someone, right? So a right is a claim that one can make right, for something or to something, usually from someone or some group. Um, so typically where there's a claim that one has to something, there's a corresponding duty that that claim be upheld, right? So think about um, an easy case. Think about one of the important rights that we have, the right to life, which involves like a cluster of rights, doesn't it? When you unpack it, think about it carefully. But just think about just having a right to life. Well, if, if, if you have a right to life, then there's a claim on others not to kill you or not to do things that put you in harm's way such that your death is imminent or the like. Does that make sense? So typically where there's a right, there's, well, we know that there's a claim involved, but then there's a corresponding obligation, perhaps a necessary one holding between a right and a duty, a right and an obligation. So if you, if you have the right to life, then I have the right to, um, I have the right not, I have the right, or I'm sorry, I have the obligation not to kill you and vice versa. If I have the right to life, then, then you have the obligation not to kill me. That's just an easy example. If you have the right to free speech, then I have obligation not to prevent you from speaking, from using your speech. There's another easy example, thinking about a significant right that we're pretty 
well aware of. So there's rights and there's corresponding duties. Just to round things out here, there are positive duties, or positive rights, negative rights, and then positive duties and negative duties. So a positive, a positive right is a right that you have to be benefited. So cases like paradigmatic cases where we see, where we, where we um, see positive rights would be um, children in relation to their parents. Children have positive rights to be benefited by their parents. Parents then have positive duties, positive obligations to provide those benefits. And there's positive rights, or sorry, there's negative rights as well. The right not to be interfered with and the right not to be killed, but they're corresponding to those negative rights or negative obligations, negative duties. The negative right not to be interfered with, or the, sorry, the negative duty not to interfere with others, the negative duty to, um, to not kill others, etc. That's hopefully just some simple examples to wrap our minds around. So Thompson's solutions in involve thinking about this concept of rights. Okay. Any questions or clarifications needed? Let's see what's in the chat here. Uh, okay, I think this question was asked already. If I didn't answer, if I didn't answer it, please let me know. Okay. I think it was is Yasmin's question. If I'm saying your name right, if I'm wrong, saying it wrong, let me know. Feel free to correct me. Um, so let's go to the Thompson, um, the to the trolley problem, page fourteen oh three. This is something I, I want you to note. You can go back to it because I think it'd be helpful to remember this passage because if you're ever lost in some of the weeds of the Thompson and understanding her solution, this passage will set you straight. At least that's my hope. So 1403, this is um, right at the very beginning of section five. So again, Thompson, when she's thinking about the, the trolley problem, trying to solve it, providing her solution, she's thinking about the bystander case and the transplant case. What accounts for the moral difference between them? So here she goes, suppose the bystander at the switch proceeds. So we're thinking about the bystander case here. He throws the switch, flips the switch, thereby turning the trolley onto the right-hand track. The way I drew it up, it was the left-hand side, but work with me. Thereby causing the one to be hit by the trolley, thereby killing him, but saving the five on the straight track. There are two facts about what he does. So it's really this part here that's so significant. There are two facts about what he does, which seemed to me to explain the moral difference between what he does and what the agent in transplant would be doing if he proceeded, if he were to operate on the healthy patient, harvest the organs and all the rest, right? Of course, which would kill the healthy patient. She continues, in the first place, the bystander saves his five by making something that threatens them instead threaten one. Again, so I'll put, it in, I'll put it in a different way here. In the first place, the bystander saves right, the five uh, workers, trolley workers, by making something that threatens them, instead threaten the one, okay, by directing the trolley toward the one trolley track worker, okay? So that's, that should be pretty straightforward. Okay. And second, the bystander does not do that, does, does not do that, does not threaten the one trolley track worker by means which themselves constitute an infringement of any right of the ones. So the, the way in which the means taken to divert danger to the one away from the five in the bystander case does not involve violating a right 
of the one trolley track worker. It's the means themselves that don't do so. That's what's important to note here. The means taken to deflect or redirect danger to the one as opposed to the five away from the five don't involve okay a violation or infringement of any right of the ones of the one trolley track workers so i think if you keep coming back to this you should be fine i'm going to try to unpack this and explain this uh, more i just wanted to read this passage for you and, and highlight it so you can keep coming back to it if need be Let's just, just um, while we're here, think about what happens in transplant case. In the transplant case, if, he, if the surgeon were to perform surgery on the healthy patient to harvest the organs, to give them to the dying patients, to save the dying patients, the means taken to redirect danger away from the dying patients to the healthy patient essentially involve a violation of the healthy patient's rights. Right? The unwilling operation that'd be performed on him to harvest his organs. If you think about it like this in the bystander case, in order to redirect danger toward the one trolley track workman, the means taken involve re flipping a switch, throwing the switch, as Thompson calls it, right? And throwing a switch all by itself doesn't involve what? Violating anyone's rights. Okay, so that's the crucial thing. If you're getting that, then you're doing great. And I'll, but don't worry, I'll say it again on the slide. So you'll see, you know, it not just through my voice, but also through words on the slide. So I know it's a bit tricky at first, it can be anyways. Okay, so let's go back to the bystander cases. Just walk through this, make sure we've got this. So danger is directed towards the five. Bystander can direct the danger towards the one. Right, away from the five, right? He can do so by means that themselves do not constitute an infringement on the rights of the ones, of ones, excuse me. So here I'm just using very Thompson-like language. By means that themselves do not constitute a violation of, one, of, of the one's rights, yeah? Be another way of putting um, the point here. But still, that's, that, that's abstract, right? And we put it more concretely, but let's have a look. Again, transplant case, we're surgeon. Oh, well, actually, we'll talk about the transplant case, and then we'll come back to the, um, uh, to the bystander case with, um, with more concrete detail. So I deal with the bystander transplant cases abstractly here on the slides first, and then in turn deal with them uh, concretely. So transplant case, we're surgeon to direct danger to healthy patient in order to free dying patients of danger, the danger that they're in because they have failing organs, he would have to do so, again, through means that constitute an infringement of the rights of healthy patients. So the means taken to divert danger, right, involve right, this infringement of the rights of healthy patients. Okay, so now back to the bystander case talking about it more concretely, bystander simply needs to turn the trolley onto the tracks on which the one is situated, the one right, trolley track worker. So it's this phrase here, right? That's capturing the action, right? The means that need to be taken in order to divert danger away from the five onto the one, right? In order to redirect danger from the five to the one. And in doing this in itself, does not constitute an infringement on the right, on the rights of ones. Okay. So that phrase right there, that's that's that captures the means taken in the bystander case. We're turning trolleys in this way, or directing trolleys by turning a switch, flipping a switch, okay, by them uh, by itself doesn't involve a violation of one's rights of the one's rights. Okay, now, now the transplant case. Again, I've already noted this, but just so you can see it again, surgeon needs to operate on an unwilling patient. That's the phrase that's important, isn't it? Like 
operating on an unwilling patient is the means that surgeon needs to take in order to redirect danger from the healthy patients to the, um, or, or away from the dying patients to the healthy patient, excuse me. And the five to the one. The means that surgeon needs to take to redirect danger from the dying patients to the healthy patient do constitute an infringement of healthy patients' rights. Okay, so that's the solution. What Thompson wants to do next, and I think this next case that we talk about will help, I think, drive home her solution even more. She wants to give us a case, another trolley case, um, I believe as a way of independently um, showing um, that her solution is the correct one, or at least one to be taken very seriously. So now we're gonna talk about the Footbridge case, um, this is known as the fat man case. If you're interested, there's a book out there recently published by David Edmonds. I think it's co-written, but I can't remember, but David Edmonds is called, would you push the fat man? You might be interested in it. Lots of discussion of trolley cases more than you can imagine. But we're going to talk about, I call it the footbridge case as opposed to the fat man case. Um, so let's, let's have a look. Um, Let's go to 1409, the Thompson here. Okay, so it's at the beginning of section seven. So um, after giving her solution, you know, she deals with some potential responses to her solution. We don't need to get into those weeds unless you guys want to talk about them. But more precisely, she notes here at the beginning of session seven, it is not morally required of us that we let a burden descend out of the blue onto five when we, when we can make it descend instead onto one if, if in italics here, if we can make it descend onto the one by means which do not themselves constitute infringements or violations of, of rights of the one, so this captures her you know, solution again in slightly more complicated language. And then she moves on really, really quickly to the, what she calls the fat man case. I call the footbridge case. Consider a case, which I call the, which I call the fat man, in which you are standing on a footbridge over the trolley track. You can see a trolley hurtling down the track out of control. You turn around to see where the trolley is headed and there are five workmen on the track where it exits from under the footbridge. What to do? Being an expert on trolleys, you know of one certain way to stop an out of control trolley, drop a really heavy weight on its path, but where to find one? It just so happens that standing next to you on the footbridge is a fat man, a really fat man. He is leaning over the railing, watching the trolley. All you have to do is to give him a little shove and over the railing he will go. So he must be leaning pretty good into things there onto the track in the path of the trolley. Would it be permissible for you to do this? Everybody to whom I have put this case says there would not be, but why? Now I haven't had her luck in everybody claiming that it would be impermissible to do this, but I'd say 98% say that. And sometimes actually it depends on the order of the trolley cases that I present them, how people answer and respond to the footbridge case as I call it anyways. Okay, so back to our presentation here. I, I picked, I found a couple um, images depicted online of the footbridge case. The only difference here, work with me, is just that these individuals are tied down as opposed to just working. So that's just a contingent difference in the presentation, isn't it? But here's the Portly fella, as I call him, PF. So now you know why Portly fella has a cameo appearance earlier. He's now here. And there you are. And all you have to do is give a little push. And he'll, his mass will stop the momentum of the trolley, saving the five. Danger can be redirected from who? From the five onto the one. Is it permissible? Thompson says no. Okay, 
here she can invoke her, the theoretical framework she's given us having to do with rights, can she? The means that would be that are the means that are required to redirect the danger from the five to the one involve violating the one's rights. Yeah. You got to push him. You got to shove him, shove him off a footbridge. It probably violates his right that you shove him in the first place. So as we say in philosophy, a fortiori, right? Or all the more, right? It's going to be a violation of his rights to shove him off a footbridge. Okay. Here's another um, depiction of the footbridge case. So some don't like the fact that the way Tom said the case is you got to push, um, you got to shove the poorly fella. They think that taints the, the intuitions that we have in thinking about the case. So instead, there you are in your fancy suit, you just got to flip this switch. Or bystander here makes it a cameo appearance. He's ready to go at the switch, you see? So, but the means taken here, right, again, seem to violate poorly fellow's rights, right? It's not, it's not a shoving, but it's a thrusting off of a footbridge using mechan a mechanical switch, using mechanical means, not your, not your very hands to do the, the dirty work. Is that okay? No, you're still infringing on his rights. Sorry? I said, no, it's not okay because you're still infringing on their rights. Oh, yeah, yeah, that's right. I, I think I, what I meant was, is that okay in the sense of, um, is that okay that uh, it made sense what I said, but I, I, I hear you. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Sorry, you can continue. Yeah. So here we got the footbridge case. So the means required to direct danger towards uh, poorly fella and thus away from the five track workers constitutes an infringement on poorly fella's rights. This explains the moral difference between bystander and footbridge. Okay, it provides independent support, doesn't it, for Thompson's solution? Because we can multiply these if we wanted, oh, you know, ad nauseum, right? Until we're sick of thinking about it, in other words. Okay. So on his face, it's pretty, sounds pretty ingenious, right? I mean, there have been people who have responded to Thompson, but on, on his face, this is a pretty ingenious re reply, or uh, attempted solution anyways. So here's something I wanted to take up. Um, this is something that, that Thompson deals with uh, in her paper. Um, um, there's a host of things that she takes up, but this is something I wanted to take up that I think is important. Um, because some of you might be thinking that when we go back to the bystander case, you might be thinking um, the one track worker um, to whom right uh, danger is redirected his rights are violated for crying out loud. He has the right to life. And that right to life is violated. That is violated because you're, because you're killing him. You're killing him. So when you flip the switch and direct the trolley in that direction. So, so doesn't the one track worker and bystander have his right to life violated? Now, some in the literature, according to Thompson, say, no, he doesn't. Because the situation is such that he's he in virtue of being in the situation he's in loses the right to life or something like that. Thompson says that's an absurd view of having the right to life. You don't lose the right to life because you're in the bystander circumstance, right? The bystander case circumstance. So bystander retains, sorry, the one track worker in the bystander case retains the right to life. And it is violated. And then she has, she says more. It's just that the means to directing a burden or a danger or a catastrophe, I add there a little bit to what Thompson said there. I think she's using burden just more inclusively. I'm trying to draw that out by including danger and catastrophe. So it's just that the means to directing a burden or a danger or catastrophe away from five towards one doesn't itself constitute an infringement, a violation of the one track worker's rights. That's the crucial thing. So the end game, the end result is gonna be, yes, the one track worker 
his right to life is violated. Okay. And there's a sense in which when bystander flips the switch, that bystander does wrong, does wrong to the one. And that makes like clear common sense, doesn't it? Bystander killed him. And according to morality, something wrong happened to him then. All things being equal, right? He's an innocent person. He just happened to be in the wrong place at the wrong time. You see? So Thompson here, she says, a wrong has happened. And she puts in italics to him, to the one track worker. His right to life has been violated. But it's a complex moral situation. Does that make sense? So it was permissible in that case to do this wrong to the one trolley track worker. Why? Because it's permissible in some cases to avert burden, catastrophe, disaster to the many to redirect it to the few. Morality tells us that. And so what's, what's gonna come down to is the means that are taken to bringing about the wrong thing in question, the killing of an innocent in this case. Does that make sense? Okay. So then if you think about then the original trolley case, the same thing's true there. The one trolley track worker who, who we can direct the trolley to, putting him in danger, put him in, in a catastrophic circumstance, put him in that tough circumstance, we can do that. We wrong him. We violate his right to life, but we can do so because we're averting a catastrophe to the many or the five in the case. Okay, good. So now taking a step back and thinking about things in a big picture way. So like kind of in some sense, abstracting away a bit from the Thompson and seeing, trying to see this, um, uh, some of the aspects of her paper from um, more of a bird's eye view, big picture view. Original trolley gives us reason to think that morality permits us in some cases to redirect a burden, danger, catastrophe away from the many towards the few. There, there are likely theoretical reasons for this. And this is what you know, Thompson's after, right? But the case shows us that. Obviously it's a cooked up kind of case, but we could imagine and think about cases that have actually happened where morally speaking, redirecting danger from the many to the few, the many to the one is morally okay, acceptable, despite the fact that we do something wrong to an individual, the individual or individuals that make up the few who have been killed or otherwise harmed in order to avert catastrophe to the many or the five. So the utilitarian explanation for this moral permission, just going back to the original trolley case, fails as is, as is seen by thinking about transplants, right? The killing versus letting die explanation for this moral permission fails as seen thinking about bystander. Or perhaps even before you, before you get to thinking about the killing versus letting die, especially you just, might, you, you just might say, I think as Thompson does earlier in the paper, that the killing versus letting die principle just doesn't apply in this case because it's killing versus kill, or killing, yeah, killing versus killing, either option. There have been some though, and I, I, I note this in, on this slide because there are some who have wanted to respond by saying that it is a case of killing versus letting die because the default direction is to go, um, is, is, for the, is for the trolley to kill the five, you see? So some do wanna make that move. So to cover some additional basis here, I include um, this uh, point about killing versus letting die and it's like the explanation in relation to the original trolley case. Okay, and then the Kantian form of humanity explanation for this moral permission fails is, is a scene by thinking about the loop case. Okay, it's just false. Utilitarianism is false. The Kantian form of humanity is false. Okay, the killing versus letting die principle, if it applies, isn't gonna work because we have the, we have the bystander case that counts against it. And then we could under our breath say there are countless other cases which show that the killing versus letting die principle might not have the generality that its adherents think. 
Thompson has a paper on Killian versus letting die. If you're interested, you could um, do a JSTOR search. It should be there. Um, uh, the Cal Poly JSTOR um, database. So then Thompson's solution is the correct explanation involves thinking about rights. We already know that. What morally permits redirecting burdens, dangers, catastrophes away from the many towards the few. Again, in cases where such redirections are morally permissible, and Thompson thinks that there are going to be cases that are clear to us where such redirections are morally permissible, but they're not always going to be um, obvious to us. There are going to be cases where we're not sure. That's a virtue she, she thinks of her, of her solution, as it turns out. Um, ethics is hard. There are going to be lots of cases where we don't know what the right answer is, whether or not our principle or our, our solutions apply. again, to continue, is grounded in the means that are taken in such redirections. If the means of such redirections involve no constitutive right, rights violations to the few towards whom the burdens, dangerous catastrophes are directed, then such redirections are morally permissible. So again, I'm trying to um, put the if then sort of claim in the reverse that she originally presented it by putting the if right out front. If so, more precisely, if it's not morally required of us that we let a burden descend out of the blue onto the five, when we can make it instead descend onto one, if we can make it descend onto, onto the one by means which do not themselves constitute infringements or violations of the rights of the one. So this is another one of those passages that you can hang your hat on if you're sort of getting lost in some of the details in the paper. More precisely, it's not really required of us that we let an avalanche kill the five, right? Think about like people just going for a, going for a hike and an avalanche is about to smash them. It's not more required of us that we let an avalanche smash and kill the five when we can make it instead to send that same avalanche onto the one. Supposing we have some mechanical means of, of doing so at our disposal. If we can make it descend onto the one by means. So which do not themselves constitute infringements of rights of the one. And she, she italicizes the if here. She doesn't make it a necessary condition. She doesn't say only if, she says if. So it's a sufficient condition as we say in philosophy, as we say in logic, okay? So don't confuse the if with an, with, don't confuse the if with an only if, and don't confuse the if with an if and only if. So it's, it's sufficient that it's enough right? that if we can, if we can um, push the avalanche, redirect the avalanche away from the five to the one without um, thereby violating any of the rights of the one, then it follows that, right? It's not morally required that we allow the avalanche to smash and kill the five, you see? So that's just a different way of putting Thompson's point. And I'm hoping that by seeing the articulations in different ways, um, you'll be able to grasp the, the concept and the solution better. So again, it's another one of these passages you can come back to, I think it'd be helpful. Okay, so that's, that's what I have for the, um, for the Thompson and her solution for this time. Any questions or comments? Um, issues lingering from what I said there. There's one last thing I wanna do after, um, after dealing with the, this trolleyology stuff, the, the lecture portion. We just wanted to give you an opportunity to um, discuss this if you wanted to. Um, I, if, if you don't, if you're good, then I'll move on and there might be, um, there might be a better way of getting some discussion going by bringing up some practice questions I wrote up. Um, we have a writing assignment posted next week. So it's good if we start thinking about some of the kinds of questions you would see on the assignment. So um, I have on this, this Word document, hopefully you can see it all okay. Make it a little bit bigger for you. Um, multiple choice questions and some true false questions. I wanna give you some samples of 
a or of a, um, of essay questions or the right the written responses I'm gonna have you guys do with rubric so you have a sense of what to um, expect when the first writing assignment is posted. I didn't get to those this time, but I'll I'll send out some samples this weekend, um, likely on Saturday, and then we can discuss them if you like first thing on uh, Tuesday's lecture. Okay. So for now, let me just introduce the multiple choice questions and what they'll look like roughly, and then what the true false will look like. Okay, so uh, multiple choice questions. So here are the instructions. The prompts may, uh, below may have more than one correct answer. Select all the correct answers. So if you don't select all the correct answers, then points will be marked off for not doing so. Um, hopefully that's clear in the instructions. Now, you might ask, why would I do that to you? Why would I have more than one possible correct answer? Well, one reason I do this is because it gives students the opportunity to get partial credit. So if you're doing an assignment with 100 points and you get you know, four or five multiple choice questions and you know the topic, but you just mess up, there's only one, there's only one correct answer, then there's no room for partial credit. You just get all five points off or whatever it is. When there's more than one correct answer, you can get partial credit. So that's one of the main reasons for that. Okay, so don't let that throw you off. Just go through each of the options carefully, knowing that it could be one of the correct ones. I think multiple choice, when you think about it like this, it really just is a kind of way of presenting a true false question, right? Is A true, is B true, is C true on the basis of the setup of the prompt, yeah? And that could be a helpful way of thinking about multiple choice questions. So let's do number one. An example of a non-utilitarian principle discussed in lecture is, we can give you, um, you know, 10 seconds or so to answer these. So A, it is better to kill than to let die. Maybe I should read the um, options first before I give you time. A, it is better to kill than let die. B, it is better to let die than to kill. C, it is right to treat humanity as an end in itself unless doing so results in less overall happiness and not treating humanity as an end in itself. Or D, all of the above. Let's take 10 seconds. And, I'll, and then I'll give you the opportunity if you just want to shout out the answer. Answers, plural. Okay, and time, anybody want to shout it out or them out? It's B and C. Okay, we've got B and C. Anybody else have any, anything different? The right answer. I thought it was just B. Just B? Right answer is B. Right answer is B. Um, so certainly um, is better to kill than to die wasn't one of the principles, right? That's goes, that's the, the reverse of, of B. The opposite of B. Uh, this is just the killing versus and die principle. Okay. Um, and then C is not the formula of humanity, even though it might look like it may look like it at first, because the formula of humanity has nothing to do with um, um, happiness being promoted. Another way of thinking about it is the formula of humanity holds even if on balance unhappiness results because the Kantian principle of humanity, the formula of humanity is not a utilitarian principle. So what you're thinking about it is, given that we always have to live up to the formula of humanity, even if living up to the formula of humanity ends up leading to on balance more, more unhappiness than happiness, even quite a bit more, right? It, we still have to live up to the formula of humanity. We still have to treat people as if, as if they have absolute moral worth. Okay. So yeah, so B was the only right answer. Um, another thing to, um, so maybe a couple of things. One, one thing to note here is obviously I'm testing on non-utilitarian principle that we talked about, but also this bit about discussion in lecture is important. So you're gonna see questions, multiple choice questions, uh, maybe true false questions that, that may have components like deal with keeping you honest for keeping up with the course material. 
So that's why you've got the discussed in lecture bit. So there could be a principle here that's non-utilitarian, but it wasn't discussed in, in, in lecture. That's a possibility. Likewise, there could be reading questions. So I wanna make sure that reading is happening. It'll be about something big picture that happened in the reading that you would get if you read it carefully, not minutia that's covered in, in, the, in the reading. So just questions like these to kind of keep you honest um, will be um, on weekly assignments or on the writing assignments, excuse me. And then maybe just say a couple of more things about um, why C isn't true if, if what I said earlier wasn't helpful or helpful enough. So um, according to the formula of humanity, it's, all, it's, it's always right um, to avoid treating um, any human being as a slave, even if for whatever reason, however wonky the scenario is, treating an individual as a slave would promote more happiness. Does that make sense? Like a logical space, like imagine like a scenario in which if we just slave this one individual in society, everyone will, everyone will be made happier. Suppose it's a small society or something like that. Does that make sense? The form of humanity says, even in that situation, well, more happiness would, would come from enslaving someone still applies. So we can't enslave the individual in question. Okay. Number two, Thompson argues, all things being equal, morality permits killing the one track worker in original trolley, even though the trolley was directed at the five track workers. B, all things being equal, morality permits killing the one track worker and bystander, even though the trolley was directed at the five track workers. C, all things being equal, morality permits killing the portly fellow in footbridge. And D, all of the above. So maybe take 10 seconds, give everyone a chance to think about it. Okay, anybody want to shout it out? Don't be bashful. A and B. A and B is right. A and B is right. Okay. So remember, all things being equal, morality doesn't permit killing the point of the footbridge case because the means taken right to um, direct danger away from the five to the one, the poorly fella involves violating poorly fella's rights. He has to be shoved or otherwise thrown off a footbridge. Okay. Okay, and then A and B just drop out of thinking about the original trolley and bystander case, according to Thompson anyways. So know what I'm asking here is what Thompson argues, not what you may think. Okay, thinking about conclusion that Thompson has. So. Keep that in mind when I'm asking you these questions. There will be um, opportunities in the written responses to offer you know, your opinions and to justify them okay, using, the, using some of the theoretical uh, tools that I'm gonna um, help you um, develop in your writing and thinking. Okay, so true or false. So each prompt is either true or false. If part of a prompt is, is false, then it's entirely so. It's entirely false. All answers require justification for the truth value provided. So if that terminology throws you off here, just keep this in mind, there are two truth values, true or false. So this is just to let you know that when you um, evaluate a prompt, I need to see true or false. Um, so it just can't be assumed that the justification um, that you write um, uh, is going to tell me whether or not you intend true or false. Um, justifications are to be written in complete sentences of at least 50 words. So when the assignments, they have minimum word requirements, they'll be um, partly worked out here in true and false. I'm thinking about adding maybe a, a justification to multiple choice, but I haven't got there yet. Um, but with the true false, definitely. The goal there, the reason for that is, um, is to avoid luck and then also to be able to get partial credit once again. 
Um, because sometimes justification can be really good, even if the even if the wrong truth value is given, and that can get you some um, get you some partial credit. Um, typically, what will happen is if if um, if say a true false question is worth ten points, then what I'll do is. Um, if you get the wrong truth value, there's five points off. And then if you give me good justification, then you get five points. But if justification is really awesome, then you might get more. So getting the correct truth value would, uh, does matter. Um, so looking at three, Thompson uses the bystander case to show that Kant's formula of humanity fails to explain the moral difference between original trolley and transplant. So maybe take a couple seconds there, 10 seconds. Okay, time's up. What do you say? True or false? False. Okay, that's false for sure. And just roughly, you're not in 50 words, but just roughly, why is it false? Go ahead. The loop demonstration was what messed up the formula of humanity. There you go. That's right. So that's one way of going. So you could say Thompson uses a loop case. And then you're thinking, well, how do I get to 50 words? Well, tell me a little bit about the loop case, right? Something like that. Um, another way of going here could be to round out just another possibility would be Thompson uses the bystander case to show that the killing versus letting die principle, right? doesn't hold with the generality, right? Or doesn't explain the moral difference between original trolley and transplant. So you can go that route and then tell me a little bit more about how that works. 50 words comes up quickly when you're trying to justify. And you can always go over in words. Don't worry about that, okay? It's just that um, do your best to avoid um, what's unnecessary. So if you're going, if you're, if you're gonna be writing over 50 words, make sure it's relevant and salient. So you're not just giving a bunch of words. So I have to kind of, you know, comb through what you wrote to find the correct answer in there. Does that make sense? Okay. Cause you could get points um, off for that. Um, so try to focus your answers to responding directly to the prompt. When there's a whole lot else that's there, sometimes what's going on is um, students don't know what um, they don't know how to directly respond to the prompt, so they just put a bunch of material out there and hope that some of what they wrote is correct. Okay, so I'm looking for like direct responses. Number four, Thompson claims that there's no moral difference between bystander and transplant. Let me think about those cases. Her argument for this claim is that in both cases, the means to directing danger away from the five towards the one do not themselves violate the rights of the one. So take 10 seconds. All right, true or false class? True. Okay, so we've got true. Anybody else say anything different? False. False. I think false. False. Okay, that's yeah, false. Anybody want to just roughly, not in 50 words, you don't have to do 50 words, roughly want to say why it's false? I think, isn't it because in the, God, I'm trying to, in the transplant case, um, the healthy patient is having their rights violated by basically being forced to give away their organs while in the bystander case, it's not as it, the, the person is still having their rights violated, but it isn't in the means of, it's only through the means of, of pulling the lever, if exactly. I'm correct. So yeah, the means toward redirecting the danger to the one. Yeah, it was means it, of yeah. redirecting the danger, yeah. Yeah, yeah you got it. So, so um, in other words, there is a moral difference between bystander and transplant case, and then you offer the justification just offered, you see? And that gets you to 50 words in no time. Okay, that, or you could, um, you know, challenge the second claim too, couldn't you? Only in the one case 
Is it the case that the means of directing danger away from the five towards the one does not um, itself violate the rights of the one or the means that do not themselves violate the rights of the one, right? And then specify which one and then um, say that in the other case, um, those means don't um, involve the violation of the rights of the one. So here's, here's, here's an important point that I wanna note is that um, when, when you have a prompt where there's two sentences, both sentences are false, it's sufficient that you, you justify um, the falsity of one of the sentences only. You don't have to do both. So there could be sentence, there could be prompts that have up to three, four sentences. If there's more than one sentence that's um, that's false, just pick one if you want and explain why it's false. And there you go. Does that make sense? You don't have to do everything because that's likely to get you over the 50 words. Get you well over the 50 words. So I want, you know, I don't want anyone to feel obligated to do over the 50 words. So what I'll do when I um, uh, write up the writing as, uh, assignment um, in the instructions, I'll have that included so so you don't forget. But um, any anything I can help with? Questions, comments, concerns? Hopefully this um, was helpful to see some sample questions. And again, I'll be um, sending out some practice written response questions this weekend. Okay, so if you're good, then hang in there. Um, wish you all well. And I have office hours starting in a little bit. Feel free to stop by. If not, then I'll see you all on uh, Tuesday. Thanks for coming and be well. Thanks to you, Professor. Thank you. Thank you. Have a nice day. Thank you. Thank you.